Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Choking Hazard podcast. We've got a great episode for you today. Today, we're getting a chance to sit down with founder and CEO of Epic Rolls BJJ, Matt Wallstrom. Before we get started, don't forget to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you want to keep seeing more guests, athletes, coaches, different technique breakdowns, event breakdowns, make sure you subscribe and don't forget to share. Today's episode is brought to you by Spirit Leaf Waterdown, located at 64 Hamilton Street North in Waterdown, Ontario. If you're looking for Canada's top cannabis brand, look no further than Alex and his crew, and they're going to get you all set up. Just make sure you like their social media and our social media, and you're going to save money every single time you shop there. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Enjoy the episode, and we'll see you soon on the map. I'm a Republican. Right. I don't believe in having another man between my legs. I don't do jujitsu. That's, that, that's still going to get us canceled, but <laughs> at least we don't get censored by Google. That is just true. We're, we're working differently in different forms. Thank you, everybody, for joining us here at the Choking Hazard Podcast. We are joined today by Matt Wallstrom. He is the CEO and owner of Epic Rolls. He is also an entrepreneur, and we're here to talk about, especially about him, his business, especially things that he's been doing, obviously, within the last decade of you training jujitsu so we're excited to have him on the show matt thanks for joining us today man guys thank you so much for having me i appreciate it it's good to hang out with you tonight absolutely so matt like i we kind of got connected obviously through instagram but obviously doing a little bit more research about yourself as you have this company that it's epic roles and which is doing more again it's an amazing company you guys have done a lot of different things with the jujitsu community so how did you kind of like come into that and or how did it even form yeah. So, um, it actually, the name kind of came to me at one point and I was going to, I, uh, the idea was I was going to start making jujitsu videos, kind of intermediate beginner advance, you know, level videos with a friend of mine, Philip, and I bought the URL for it. And around that time I had found out about drop shipping. I don't know if you guys are familiar with drop shipping yep. at all. So I found out about that and long story short, I had looked at doing another business that involved drop shipping. That was a totally different industry that was not, uh, didn't really resonate with me. I wasn't passionate about it. And I kind of thought, Hey, you know, Epic world's kind of a cool name. Maybe I can make some jujitsu shirts just selfishly, just kind of for myself because I had a lot of the other, um, shirts, the jujitsu shirts that were kind of out on the market at the time all the normal stuff, the Choke Republic shirts, it was just kind of there. And I, and I thought th there wasn't really this lifestyle brand. Like I felt like that was something that was missing in that space was just something that was a little bit more of a lifestyle brand that wasn't so aggressive or in your face. Um, and I started with just the basic logo, putting it on um, the shirts and had a few other ideas. So I kind of put those out and was printing them and kind of wearing them and um, wearing them, showing my friends and, and everybody was kind of like, oh, that's kind of cool. Like those, those are kind of cool. And then they wanted to buy some and, and that kind of just perpetuated and kept evolving and evolving. And it went from making a few dropship t-shirts to you know, where we are now doing full collaborations with like amazing people and different companies and making geese and rash guards and fight shorts and all kinds of fun stuff. So it's incredible to how, how it's kind of evolved. Um, I, you know, but, uh, um, and it's an amazing, you know, community for, for jujitsu. So it's even more fulfilling because that's such a tight knit community. So it's kind of a double whammy. I found something that is it, it, jiu-jitsu is such a huge part of my life. So to have, have a business where I can incorporate that into, you know, my life and have an opportunity to connect with people around the entire world is, is amazing. So, um, so yeah, it's been a, it's been a fun journey so far. What's been, what's been some things that you look for in like gear, like shirt, like when you're, you know, you're doing your drop shipping, like it, with gear and geese and things like that, like, what are some things that you're looking for? And like, are the guy or guys approaching you for overseas being like, hello, friend, my name is Steve. I have product for you now. Please try here. Link here. Like 500 times a day. <laughs> <laughs> so, got, so much. Yeah. Those, that, that's a difficult situation. Um, manufacturing is really tough. I'm really making it my goal this year to try and get as much of the collection of, of products made in the United States 
it's just challenging. There's a reason that Origin is kind of the only company out there really doing it. You know, they bought a loom and they're making their own fabric. And it's, mm-hmm. and even with them, even that process takes time, right? Like they, they have delivery times. It's not just you're getting it the next day if you order a gi or a pair of boots or whatever. So it's even challenging for them and they, they make them here. So that's kind of just one of those things where everybody's dealing with that same issue. Um, I'm lucky to have some pretty great connections with my business partner and, and a few different folks that I, I think it will be possible to get rash guards and shorts, you know, made here, which as again, logistically delivery times, all just, keeping up with inventory, everything is, it's very challenging when you have to go overseas, but it's just kind of the, the way it is, unfortunately, right now. So, um, so that's always, that's always fun to deal with. <laughs> yeah. Um, you got, you got to you respect know. some of the hustle though, from like overseas, like, hello friend, how you do? <laughs> oh man, absolutely. No, they, they, and you know what, there are so many that I was talking to, to my, my guy who I've, I've worked with this entire time, you know, over the years, I was fortunate to get a connection from someone who already had done work with this gentleman. So it wasn't just a random shot in the dark. I hope that this guy doesn't steal my money. So I was talking to him and I was like, man, I really get contacted by so many of these people all the time. Like every day there's people, they're trolling you on what's happened. DMing you and commenting on your stuff and this and that, doing all this stuff. And I, I do appreciate the hustle, but it, but he's like, yeah, it, it's like 10% of them are real and, and the other 90% are scams. And that's what you have to contest with. So it's a, mm-hmm. it's very challenging um, to do that. I've just been lucky. I've had the same guy the whole time. He's been fantastic. And as much of a difficulty as it is to deal with the, you know, the overseas and delivery times, um, you know, we make it work. Yeah. And like you said, like I, I, me as like a consumer, like I would have, I appreciate like origin, for example, how they, they got a loom back to the United States. They show you the videos of them reinstalling it in their factories. Like they're, they're actually really proactive as far as making things American. And I think that's a big thing. We're trying to get manufacturing back into the U S or back into North America where we're supplying our own things. And I think that's something that we've had learned. It's been a tough lesson over the last couple of years, but obviously this is something that's happening more often than not now. No doubt. <clears throat> yeah. It's challenging um, for sure, but we're making do and, and it limits, you know, what products you can put out there and, um, I would, there's a lot of other things that I would, I would love to do, but I just kind of have to pace myself and, and, you know, yeah, like any business so. person, needs to, you have, you can't <laughs> do everything all at once, right? You got to, you know, step-by-step step work into it. Absolutely. That's what we've, Absolutely. that's what we've been doing with this podcast, right? Aaron, we've been doing that step-by-step step, and I think we're still on step one. Yeah. No, we're like <laughs> step three, I think more out of the plan. But um, like you talk about like collaboration. So like, obviously, I mean, congratulations on this new partnership that you have with like company like Kill Cliff. Like that's a big step, obviously, and in, getting into the energy drink market, which is completely kind of obviously all jujitsu guy loves caffeine and building off that. There we go. Kill Cliff. So how'd that kind of get into play? I have so many people to, to really, um, thank over the couple of years with the networking and and meeting folks and people taking um, chances working with me. So like my buddy, Rob, who runs McDojo Life, when, when we started working together and I started doing the apparel um, for him, that was the connection with Kill Cliff. He, they are a sponsor for him. They're a sponsor of the documentary. And I was able to go out and spend some time with him and be part of the documentary that they're filming and hopefully going to be out um, hopefully this year. Um, so that was the connection with them. You know, I've, it, it's so it's serendipitous. Some of the relationships of meeting, you know, getting connected with somebody on Instagram and they know somebody else. And, you know, there was a, a girl that is, um, that models some of the clothes for me and she happens to live in Fresno and happens to train with Mason Fowler. So I got connected with him. And then because of that, he saw the stuff that, or Yuri Simone saw the stuff that I was doing with Mason. And now I'm designing his stuff for ADCC, um, and his brand. And, you know, um, Chewy working with him since the, like almost the beginning. And he's been amazing, just such an awesome guy and, um, so much fun to work with and we're doing collaborations now. So the nice part is, is that this company consists of me. So while it's, 
extremely taxing in terms of time because this isn't my full-time job. I'm a full-time real estate agent and I'm getting ready to launch a, a fitness bottle and um, and then trying to run Epic Roll. So it's, it's a lot, it's a hefty load, um, but it gives me flexibility in what I'm able to do. So, you know, Jeff Glover and I just put out a rash guard today that's for sale and <clears throat> Rob uh, from McDojo Life, we're doing kind of one-off projects every single month, these limited release products that we're doing and which from a, you know, for a designer um, and content creator is, is amazing, right? Because it's all these awesome opportunities to, to work with these fun companies and help bring their brands and like their vision to life. There's, there's a lot of athletes out there and influencers and people that have built a name for themselves, but haven't had the uh, wherewithal to execute launching their own brand. So because I was able to do this with Epic Roll with, um, you know, really relying on drop shipping to build a foundation on the business and get the brand out there without spending a ton of money on inventory, that that's huge. So, so the trial and errors and all the stuff that I went through to get to this point um, allowed me to make it very plug and play for athletes and people coming on now that, that I work with in terms of bringing their vision to life. I can, you know, I'm really just depending on myself to be able to design something cool that, that they like, and that represents Epic roll well, but <clears throat> outside of that, there's no red tape. There's no restrictions. We can really do whatever we want. We can negotiate however we want. We can make it work however we want. So that's, um, really fun and and definitely creates a whole nother level of excitement within within the business you know of what what I do with this for sure the next collab choking hazard epic rolls are dozens and dozens of fans listening to this podcast <laughs> yes absolutely absolutely yeah man the it's it's a lot of fun the the kill cliff thing we're doing a gi and a, and a rash guard and um because they they're jujitsu guys that didn't make jujitsu gear. They made other apparel and uh, awesome energy drinks, but they didn't make jujitsu gear. And so when they saw what the stuff I was doing with Rob, they asked me to kind of present them some designs for some of their drinks in kind of creating a vision off of the, you know, the artwork of, of maybe a drink of theirs and putting it into a gi and they really liked it. And then um, from that kind of spawned the idea of creating a basic, initial kill cliff hey we're making geese and rash guards and jujitsu stuff so let's just make like a one basic one that we'll keep in inventory you know long term mm -hmm. so i designed that and uh, we're getting ready to hopefully launch that one soon um, which will be super exciting so man it's uh, honestly it's it's a trip man working with these companies and doing this stuff i feel so grateful and fortunate to be doing it and uh you know it's it's been amazing so, because you mentioned one of your partners is obviously McDojo Life, which is another company that's well known, especially through Instagram. And so I'm sure you've seen like insanity, especially that Rob's been pushing out through his Instagram. And like, how does that really like, like, how does he even like get all this stuff? Does he just get it off the internet? People send him stuff. Like, how does that even work? He is, that man is a hustler. He takes his job very seriously, that brand and what he's built, he's worked extremely hard to do that. So he really spends time. I mean, he's regimented to the point where it's like, I get up at, you know, I was staying at his house and he's like, he's up at seven to, to do his morning post at this exact time and run his Instagram live, you know, pages at this exact time every single week. He's very consistent. So I really appreciate the hustle, like what, in whatever anybody does, right. You, mm -hmm. you, you have to respect that. And on top of it, he's just like a, an awesome guy, just like a really genuinely nice guy who wants to help people. And so, um, so he spends a lot of time uh, trying to curate that content himself. I'm sure he gets a lot of it sent as well. Um, it's pretty crazy. I, I would, it was really fun being able to fly out to California and to be involved in the, in, um, in the documentary for a few days because I got to hang out with Mike Beltran and like a bunch of awesome people while we were there. And, uh, and be a part of this one portion of the, the film where we had this guy coming in to teach a, uh, a self-defense class that he thought was to teach it to a bunch of people who knew nothing. And in the entire room, what he didn't know was everybody was a martial artist, like well-trained. Oh so it was amazing. <laughs> I mean, it's like, it is gold, this documentary when it comes out. I mean, everybody's going to love it, man. It's, it's hilarious. It's so funny. And it's, 
it's crazy what actually exists out there. These fucking people are nuts, man. They, they believe their own stuff. It is, you know, but, but Rob goes into like even the psychology behind it. And, and from, you know, he talks to uh, pastors and different people from like a cult perspective, because these people are nuts. I mean, they believe their own stuff. It's, it's, and it's actually after being at that one seminar with this gentleman, he decided to teach us some knife training and 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 i realized like at that moment i was like this is dangerous like all jokes aside the fact that this cat is running around getting paid to teach probably a bunch of you know soccer moms how to defend themselves is crazy because he's going to get somebody killed like it was that terrible um so these things are out there and i think it's cool that rob kind of spends time to try to keep people honest and keep the whole you know any of the martial arts legit which is kind of his little tagline you know so dust, dusting off uh, an old favorite question of me and aaron's so what so that defense in the streets what would work better that or a baron bolo in a street fight wait what defense what was the first one <laughs> the crazy knife uh, McDojo defense oh, or or a barrel bolo in a street fight. You have to pick one, but, and you have to yeah, barrel bolo to... all day long. I'll, I'll roll my head <laughs> that, in the gravel bad, a eh? little bit. I'll oh, roll my head. Was... In, I'll roll my head in broken glass. I don't care. <laughs> I I just I'll, I because I don't want to give away too much of it, but I will just say that that the words out of this gentleman's mouth at one point he said, "The first thing that you have to understand about knife fighting is that you're going to get stabbed." So he first announced <laughs> to the entire class that number one rule of fighting with knives is you're going to get stabbed. That's rule number one. He also said that you're likely going to get stabbed in the back and that if and when you get stabbed in the back, you it won't be as bad because you won't see the blood and because you won't see the blood, you won't freak out. What? Now, this was honest logic because he didn't say I'm just kidding after he was done with that statement. It, we were just like. Oh my God, like is, this is real life that this guy is actually saying you're going to get stabbed, but make sure you get it in the back because you won't see it. So the level of crazy, I mean, this is just a taste. I'm giving I think you that's a, a new shirt. A yeah. <laughs> if you're going to get stabbed, just make sure it's in the back. In the back. <laughs> you won't see it. I mean, it was crazy, man. I could not believe I, I And he kind of volunteered to teach this knife stuff. Nobody was like, hey, can you teach us how to deal with knife? He runs to his bag and grabs his little, you know, rubber knife. And I thought, if you were going to teach knife self-defense, if I was even just a, a jokester like this guy, I'm going to at least watch some YouTube videos, get some basic structure, a couple things, and I'm not going to start the seminar with you're going to get stabbed. <clears throat> that's the first line of defense. You know what I mean? That Whether that's true or not. That's $100. The worst, start it's the worst. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> thanks. You know, great. So, <clears throat> yeah, it was a, it was a, absolute joke i mean i i couldn't believe it in the stuff that he the other stuff that they did but this is a guy that comes from the line of the uh you know the no touch knockout you know chi chai movie with my mind <laughs> <laughs> crazy like, shit like we we were talking to a couple other guys especially about obviously we see these types of martial arts but then it was also it was how do these guys find the followers to follow them with it right so it's like there's fine. Okay. You have your instructor who's going to do whatever. Right. But then it's actually having the individuals that go along with this are two different things because now that's a, that's a separate level of crazy because you've been able to convince this individual. No, this works. Right. And I think it's that's real that's, to me, damn it. It's real to me. <laughs> that, well, it, that's, that's kind of the thing is that people you know, unfortunately, they like to be led. That's why a part of this documentary was about the psychology behind this mm. craziness. Like, you know, people, what, what are you doing? Like you, you buy into this. I mean, a lot of it is cultural too. There's, uh, you know, Rob's evolution, I think of the McDougal Life brand will be to go and travel to these places in the Philippines and where a lot of these Indonesia, where a lot of these crazy things exist. And, and be like, okay, I'm here. You know what I mean? Cause everybody can talk shit on the internet, but then when you actually show up, it's like, Hey, yeah, all those guys that touched your head, the master's head, they did three backflips and flew over when they touched his head. So like, let me touch your head and see if I flip or, you know, 
do your fake, you know, whatever stuff and make me fly against the wall. Like all your guys. I mean, you can, it's so theatrical. Like when you see these guys, when they're clearly throwing themselves and doing forward roles and stuff. I mean, it's the most beta ass shit I've ever seen. Like for guys to be like, this is the one guy and we're just going to all stand around. And every time he touches us, we're going to go flying through the air. What the fuck are you doing? You know what I mean? Like grow a <laughs> pair of balls and train like a man and stop being a bitch like that. I'm sorry. That is like, what are you doing, dude? Everybody's well, what, just what here if, to see the one guy. They actually have super. Yeah, come on. What come if? On. <laughs> I, I would find it hard to be like, okay, honey, I, I gotta go. I'm leaving. I'm gonna go train for the night. Okay, I'll see you later. Oh, how was class today? Well, let me tell you this. Oh, I got whirled <laughs> three times you. through the air by Sensei. <laughs> Make I touched his like, forehead. I went through the door. <laughs> oh my god, man. Yeah, it's it. It is. It is crazy. It is 100% crazy, but like people join cults, you know, yeah. that's that, nuts it, it, too. It's, it's, so it's, that is true. So I'm going to ask you because obviously Rob's not here to speak for himself, but I have an idea of what he'll say, but for yourself. So when you look at like Detroit urban survival tactical guy or whatever it is <laughs> now, do you think that's just a, a persona he's portrayed now that he's just living it or he actually <laughs> believes his own shit? I, it, it looks like absolute theatrics, like just garbage. Like he's just doing it like a master Ken kind of a thing. You're yeah. acting, you're playing this character. That That's what it appears to be. And when I saw the photo of him and master Ken, I was like, hmm, maybe this is like, you know, a maybe, thing. maybe this is just a, an actor. Too. Like at first I thought it was an act. I thought of, right. The more he's teaching, I'm like, is this guy actually serious? What the hell is going on? But but then like Tom, you know, like my boy Tom DeBlas keeps posting stuff like every day where he's like, come, I'll pay you $3,000 to come and fight one of my purple belts and, sh and you know, and it, like a female and she's going to beat your ass. And like, you know, so I don't, I don't know. Like I see a lot of people posting that they're like pissed about this guy. And if it's, if he is out there, which he may be like teaching this kind of garbage, Again, everybody jokes about it and it is funny. It's like it, you would think it's so blatantly obviously like garbage, but I guess people buy into it and maybe he's making money from it somehow. But it's very um <clears throat> it's it's not a good idea to teach people stuff like that because especially when he's talking about all those guns, you know, a lot of mm -hmm. gun stuff. Grab the the gun and just push it to this you're going to get shot in the face immediately. You know what I mean? Like, don't do that at all. And so I think it's very irresponsible for him to, if he's actually teaching that shit to people, then yes, he needs to be throat punched. And, and I would love to see a girl beat his ass. I've just seen the, I've just seen the reels online of like him showing a gun defense and then some guy trying it. And then it just, He's like, I'm gonna do it. Heaven. And it flips to like, and then he said, "Heaven." <laughs> it's he's my like, favorite. Looking shit around, ever, like, dude. oh, what happened here? He's like, damn it! Oh my god, that's well, funny. Yeah, the, the the best one was so he's like, he's like in a, a gun range or, or whatever it was outside, and he's like, okay, fire the gun. The guy fires the gun like it's a live live round, and so he's like, okay, as I grab the barrel, it's not gonna be able to shoot. He grabs the barrel and it, and chamber goes bang. And he's like, and then the guy, okay, pull the trigger again. See, he can't pull the trigger again. I'm like, he just shot you once. Like, what are you talking about? Like, he actually, Nuts, like, the, dude. And I'm like, I don't, I mean, I, I caught like it. I'm like, like, if you're, gra if you're grabbing a gun, like, uh, listen, I'm not a gun expert. I'm, I'm not a gun gonna, expert either, but I'm just like, I'm not either. I'm not a gun off. defense expert by any sense of the imagination. I'm pretty sure if you grab a gun and then like the chamber goes off, You'd be happy if you have all your fingers intact by the end of that. Yeah. Yeah, you would. And you wouldn't do that at all anyway. <laughs> like, you know, this guy, like who, who are we Rambo? Like if you, if you actually are like just a normal civilian and somebody holds a gun and they want something, give them what they want and just let them go, man. Yes. Like you don't need to be a hero. They're going to, you know, like you want to get shot. I mean, I, you want to take whatever the hell this guy, Dustin, What's his name? Dustin Diamond Diamond. Oh, I don't know. It's like Dustin Detroit, Detroit Urban fucking, Survival, whatever. It is. I don't even know. Dustin Diamond. I think that was Screech. Sorry. R.I.P. <laughs> Dustin Diamond. Screech. Screech. Dude. He may be better at doing uh, gun defenses then. But um, <laughs> yeah. this, rem there, this reminds me of a story. There was a, a Gracie one time that I did a seminar with, and they were talking about self-defense. So they're talking about, hey, like, you know, I think people were asking them, like, hey, you know, have you ever had to use 
like Gracie Jiu Jitsu or like self defense, like in the streets or something. He's like, yeah. And then like, what happened? He's like, the guy. I had an individual. I was at I was at a, a beach and somebody pulled a gun on me. So then they're at. Everyone's like, oh my god. So what did you do? And he's like, I use Gracie Jiu Jitsu to calm myself down and to give that man the, the money. <laughs> so he, he's like, listen. He's like, with. This is coming from a grace. He's just like, listen, like, I'm not going to try to like, I'm, it's not worth my life to, you know, maybe I screw something up, a, a, a knife, a gun. Like, I'm not going to, even though I practice defenses all these years, I'm not going to try, you know, to do something. And then if I make a mistake, you know, I'm dead. It's, it's not worth it. It's just, I gave, you know, I calm myself down. I gave the person their money and they just went away. And then, I think they found out who that person was like a few weeks later and the guy didn't know who he was actually robbing. He apologized. The guy was like, you know, impoverished on the streets of like Rio and all that and gave him the stuff back. And the guy was like, dude, like, what are you doing? Like, why, why you be robbing us? <laughs> that, that is absolutely the way to do it. And it's, uh, it's interesting because I recently just this week was able to go and train with Pedro Sauer. Um, uh, my buddy is a, uh, black belt at his school one of the instructors and he comes up from georgia once a month to his school here so i came up and was able to meet him which was like amazing because there are very few people in the world that are in that category of these like og jujitsu guys you know you just don't have eight degree coral belts just running around and these guys that train directly under elio and so it's amazing to listen to them and and talk and elio gracie developed jujitsu as a means of self-defense from, you know, bigger and stronger opponents in Rio growing up, Pedro Sauer saw two, three fights a day here. He sees none, you know, he says it's a totally different world, but that's, that's a huge focus of, of Gracie Jiu Jitsu is the self-defense aspect of it. And the other night when we were going through these three self-defense techniques, <clears throat> the first part of every one of those techniques was, was uh, Pedro Sauer saying, hey, my friend, my friend, no, it's okay, it's okay. And spending like a good amount of time like coaching people that try to just don't have an ego. You don't need to try to be Rambo. You don't need to try to do this. Just the same thing. Give, you know, give them what they want. Go on, live to see another day. There's no reason to be a hero. If you're some trained Navy SEAL and you really want to roll the dice on your life and try to you know, take a gun away from somebody, do, great. But <clears throat> their philosophy is the same, you know, coming directly from you know, the deepest roots of jujitsu is like, try to, you know, be cool. Like, don't, there's no reason to, you know, if somebody closes the distance and puts their hands on you, then obviously you have a different situation, but in general, like, you know, no ego, man, no reason to yeah. do that. When you kind of, go ahead, oh, sorry, go ahead, Mike. All right. So I just wanted to change gears a little bit, but um, just talking about, you know, like you're, you're training in Virginia now, correct? I am. Yep. All right. So, like, you know, the last couple of years with the C word, what's been going on with cunt and uh, the last two years, what's been going on? That's really cunty. Um, how are schools doing down there? And uh, just like across the country as a whole, like how, how has the United States of America been dealing with the big cunty thing that's been going on the last two years? There you go, Aaron. Do you like how I did that edit? Better. Good. Better. <laughs> Better. <laughs> Better. Yeah. So, Personally, I'll tell you my experience and then what I personally, I didn't have much of a hiccup. There was maybe one month that I didn't train. The rest of the time, ever since then, I've been training. A lot of schools, people that I knew, I think it kind of went to like speakeasy jujitsu. It was like people were mm -hmm. boarding up their windows, making it look like they were closed. And it's like, you go around the back, knock three times, you know, New England clam chowder, they let you in. Um, you, you know, everybody had like this kind of random thing that they were doing kind of under wraps for a while. And, you know, a lot of people were training. However, almost everybody that I know to local school owners lost about 40% of their membership. Mm -hmm. Um, because there were so many things. It wasn't just people being afraid to train. It was like now families living with them and now they're doing this or they lost their job, or it was just, you know, like a multitude of different issues that that came up. So I think everybody definitely took a hit. A lot of, a lot of schools, there were some schools that don't survive, you know, luckily ours bounced back. And now, and now 
they're growing at like a super rapid rate. Like last year, kind of throughout the mid to the rest of the year, it was pretty consistent people coming in and joining all the time. And it really, really growing. Um, Tom de you know, I was talking to him, his school that, I mean, he was getting like 40 new students a month, you know, coming into his school, crazy, mm -hmm. crazy numbers. So, um, so it's, it's been interesting, but you know, I have schools, um, we go to Hawaii almost every year and I, there's a school in Oahu that I've been training with ever since I was like, I've probably been there for like almost 10 years going and training with him whenever I'm in Hawaii. It's like my Hawaii school and they, they've had to move twice, you know, losing membership and having to move to different places. And this last time, the time before, um, he had a 20,000 square foot facility, MMA ring, the whole nine, it was beautiful, really nice paying 20 grand a month for, for the rent doing that. And this time I went back and he's renting out space at a church, you know, and like rolling mats out and then trying now to build back up the base and, and, you know, move again to another place. And so it's, yeah, I think it's, I think it's been difficult, uh, especially based on the areas, depending on how the restrictions are in that particular area, but nothing that's, you know, we're not Australia. That's for sure. I'll tell you that. Yeah. I would say that like, especially like even up here, up in Ontario, like we've came, came out of lockdowns. Everything was law schools were back on up and rolling. Law schools did shut down, unfortunately, but then, you know, things were kind of back to normal. And then now just in the last like month and a bit, we've been shut down again. So it's back to speak easy jujitsu. And I think nowadays that people are kind of like, okay, let's, let's just get going. I mean, not, be careful. Not obviously. Three times Canadian maple syrup. And then you, you, yeah. And it's like train, time. be careful. Don't be a dick. Don't, if you have herpes, don't come to class. Like that's how yeah. it kind of works. Yeah. I've got a dojo well, in my if, house if, too. That was, that was like a the case. Aaron would never be allowed in class. Sorry. <laughs> 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 yeah i've got i've got a dojo in my house in the basement which was like a prerequisite of the house so i also have that so if i i you got know, my brother-in-law or whoever come over and, and train if I, if I absolutely had to so yeah no it's good um like kind of like when you look at like the evolution especially like between the sub because we were kind of talking about self-defense and then obviously the sport right and you're getting all again all these people who were preserving the helio side of self-defense like they're all getting older right like, how do you think, like, do you think that self-defense side is still going to survive as the sport starts to explode? Or do you think it's going to be that eventual, I don't want to call it like the karate standpoint, where it's because karate, authentic karate used to be really authentic. And then it's turned into this money type driver, right? So are we going to be able to preserve that self-defense aspect to jujitsu down in the future? I think certain associations will because there are some that are so deep rooted that I think that will continue on because it's in the curriculum like a lot of schools that have the self defense side of things there it's it's intertwined in the curriculum in a sense that you typically like with Pedro Sowers Association with the belts you have testing for each belt you know and you have to go through certain movements so there's the jujitsu side but there's also the self-defense side of the mm -hmm. curriculum that you have to absolutely know you know just the other night he's teaching three moves in jiu-jitsu class that are self-defense moves like chokes you know how to get out of them and things like that so i do think that it will stick around in some associations but i think because of the popularization of sport jiu-jitsu that it's it's changed that that wasn't really as prevalent back in the day it was mm -hmm. it was you had you know valley tudo and mma and those things but you didn't have as much sport jujitsu as you do now. So now we have this whole other subcategory in jujitsu where, which is very different. And I think it is important for people to distinguish what they are, what their intention of learning when they, when they start jujitsu, what that intention is, are you, and it could be multiple things, but are you starting jujitsu from, because you're looking for self-defense or are you starting it because you want to compete? Or are you starting it because you just want to get in shape? I mean, it could be all three, but I say that because you know, I fought MMA for a few years and the, the training that we will do for MMA with regards to jujitsu is very different. You're not going to do certain things because you can get punched in the face. So you're passing and everything is very different, not very different, but it's different than if you're 
just trying to get win points and you're just in some, you know, no game match with somebody versus a MMA fight or, or a self-defense standpoint. So I think that's, that is important to, you know, especially women maybe that are coming in or, or guys that are coming in from a self-defense standpoint to know and hear from their, their training partners or their, their instructors that, Hey, keep in mind that this is, this works now from this standpoint, but I'm not going to go for this in the street. I'm not going to do this to somebody in the street. And, and here's why I don't, you know, and whether or not those conversations happen and that information is shared, I don't know, but I, but I do think it's an important aspect for people to just at least consider, you know? Yeah. So you're saying don't pull deep half guard on a street fight. Right? <laughs> yeah. You know, right? like single leg X <laughs> in, the, in the street. I don't but know. It's unless you're probably really better than the chi guy. Like you touch their forehead, they go flying. It's better than that, but it may not, but Baron Bolo might be a little bit better than that, but deep half might be a notch above or below that. <laughs> We're trying to create like a ranking, you know? Yeah. 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 No, I get it. <laughs> so, when you look at it kind of like, because we're talking about progression, right? So you look at the explosion of like how jujitsu kind of went from the UFC and now it's kind of obviously evolutioned into ADCC, which is really, really popular. Obviously companies like Flow have really projected it kind of to put it into new heights. What do you kind of think might be like, if you kind of had to look at the future and be like, okay, this is the next step. Where do you, you again this is an estimate guess right where do you think the next step would be for the sport moving forward well i think you know i have some buddies of mine that are behind the company y&m that are with subversive um jiu-jitsu tournament to subversive and they are a huge tournament in the u.s and they were with flow for a while we're now transitioning to looking at some other options where we can broadcast it on the web without necessarily having people buy memberships. So you mm -hmm. could just purchase this one event and like it's getting, type so, thing. yeah. So we've been actually working through this model um, of how we could do this and how we could kind of set up this uh, for future events that doesn't necessarily pigeonhole people to just using flow grappling as you know they're great but but that's one thing and they sort of have a monopoly on how monopoly on how the how they work and how they internalize revenue and how they control everything so it's it's cool they're great um but there's definitely room for more right so as, as jujitsu evolves i think you'll see more tournaments coming out there i think eddie bravo's um stuff will continue to grow a lot i think i think his his um his tournament is is getting very popular people like the people combat, like to see the combat jiu -jitsu. <laughs> yeah people like to see combat jiu -jitsu. yeah they, they, they like dig seeing it. Um, other people get slapped up apparently <laughs> yeah it's like when you just when you thought jiu-jitsu was a little boring somebody gets slapped in the face you're like all right that's cool so it, it adds a little bit more of an element of i think entertainment to the non-jiu-jitsu viewers mm -hmm. people that aren't you know i mean let's be honest if you watch two black belts compete a lot of times they're boring as shit, right? It's like these micro adjustments where you're like, is anybody moving? But they, but they're so proficient. They're so good. It's just, that's that level. So sometimes, you know, those matches can be really boring. So I think adding this element into it makes it super exciting and gets really, you know, fans and kind of grabs a different part of the fan base um, and audience for, for that. So, yeah. So I think you'll see some, some additional tournaments pop up. I hope that's the case. There seems to be now this, world where people can do jujitsu as a profession, which I think is incredible. It's amazing. Um, I, I able to work with, you know, some people who, who are doing that and it's very cool to support them and see them doing these things because that just wasn't a thing. You know, when I started, I started jujitsu in 2005 and that, that was not, you weren't doing jujitsu for a profession even back then, you know, so it's been a seemingly short amount of time that now we have this whole huge thing in YouTube, like, you know, just hundreds of thousands of videos and, you know, things that are, you know, content and it's growing. And so it really, which is great for the sport because it gives, it gives, um, it makes jujitsu a lot more accessible to a lot more, a lot, you know, wider of an audience. Yeah. And like, you know, like being an entrepreneur yourself, you were talking about it. Um, what are, What's some advice you would give to somebody, you know, or like jujitsu practitioners out there that want to, you know, pursue their passion, you know, they want to pursue jujitsu more, they want to pursue it as a career. Like what advice would you, would you give those people? This is something I, I feel very, very strongly about, which is that you, 
you really can't chase money. It's difficult. There are times in your life where you're struggling and you need to make money. And I empathize with that because I've been in that spot many times in my life. But when you are able to hone in on your passion, like what it is that gets you up in the morning, you know, as a human being, we, we, th this lack of fulfillment, you know, people work on average for who just work nine to fives, I typically work 90,000 hours in their lifetime. That's so many hours to be working, doing something. You know, I know people that make a lot of money and they're miserable. They hate their jobs. They're, they live for the weekends. They live for the two weeks vacation that some, someone grants them. And, you know, and to me, life is so short. Like the time that we're given on this earth is so, so small in, in, you know, in perspective to everything. And it's so, um, so to spend time, finding out what it is that you're passionate about and what does get you up in the morning and what you, you know, we all have bad days and work is work. And I, I absolutely love what I do. And I've, I've never felt more fulfilled in my life personally, because all of my companies, everything that I'm doing is, is exactly what I, what I feel like I should be doing. You know, I feel like exactly I'm, I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. And that's such a privilege, I think, and something that I, worked my ass off for years to, to get to, you know, everybody sees the result. They don't, you know, they rarely see like the journey that, that gets there. So for anybody that's trying to figure that out, really, you know, you'd be surprised how many people I ask, Hey, if you could do anything, if you could have any job, like what, what would that be? And many times I hear, I don't know. So I ask myself then, and I'll say to them like, well, how do you expect to go anywhere when you don't know where you want to go? You're, you're, you're driving without a map. You're, you, you don't have a destination. The first thing is have a destination, figure out what you're working towards, you know? And that takes mindfulness. It takes a lot of, you know, turning off your phone and, and being in your own thoughts and being real with yourself and describing like, what are my passion about? What, what am I good at? What do I, what, what am I afraid of? But what, you know, um, what could I do that will make me feel fulfilled as a, as a human being and, and give me a rich life? It doesn't have to be just about wealth. It can just be about, you know, look at people, people nobody becomes a teacher or a, or a police officer to become wealthy, right? That's like an honorable thing that, that you're doing because you feel called to do that. And so you can apply that same philosophy towards any other career path in life. But unfortunately, I think people get very caught up in this feeling of security and this notion that you have to be taken care of and, you know, worried about failure and so much in their mind that they never even give themselves a chance to start because you've convinced yourself that, you know, out of fear that, that what if, you know, like, instead of what if I fail, it should be like, what if you succeed? What happens if you succeed? Like, what does that life look like to you? What are the, you know, so, but you'll never know if you're not able to, you know, first discover what it is that you want to be passionate about and that you want to do with your life. And then, getting up every day and just working a little bit towards that. If you look at any people and you read any books about some of the most successful people in the world, they weren't necessarily the smartest people. They were, they were people who just had grit to just keep going. They had that perseverance to just continue on and not stop. And, and every time they, you know, they got kicked down, they just kept going and kept going and didn't accept failure. And so they eventually, you know, it happened, but this is kind of becomes sort of a fairy tale to a lot of people like this notion of success and abundance and all of this, it gets kind of filtered down in our society to kind of be subdued. And I think uh, really uh, contrary to what people sort of accept as their normal narrative, you know what I mean? So what, what kind of was like your epiphany moment where it was like, you know, this is a company or these are the passions that I wanted to pursue because there's three different companies that you have evolved over time. So what was even like just being an entrepreneur, what was that trigger about? I, I think that I was always doing, I was always in sales and marketing and design and dealing with people. So there was kind of like a, a baseline in that, in, in all the things that I, that I was you know, doing over the years, whether it was working for health clubs, I used to manage a chain of health clubs on the DC, Virginia, Maryland area before they sold to Gold's Gym and worked in the health and fitness industry for years and, you know, did sales and marketing training. And so that was always a part of it, which people skills was, that's the huge thing just in general to 
that's a huge skill, life skill to have, you know? So, so I was really fortunate to get a lot of practice with that so that I could, you know, connect with people, whether I was trying to sell them something or teach them something or, you know, learn from them or whatever it was. Um, so I think it was, <laughs> it, it's kind of funny because I just remember seeing this YouTube video that kept playing. It was an advertisement and it was this guy, Ty Lopez, and he gets tons of flack on the internet because he's this entrepreneur guy, but he had this video where he was in his garage and he had like a Lamborghini and a Ferrari. And he's like, you know, I love these cars, but you know what I love more? I love books. And he started like pitching this whole thing about learning. And I don't know, man, oh, I had, yeah. do you know who I'm okay. talking about? I remember, I remember that time. A lot of people like think he's like a scumbag and think whatever. I'm like, I mean, but, but this was, this was my reality. I was at the gym and I'm like, you know, have YouTube plan. I'm seeing this. And I've had a, a picture of this Lamborghini Countach that my uncle gave me since I was like five years old and I've kept it my whole life. And so Lamborghini was always my, it was like my vision board item of, oh, I want to, you know, have this one day. And I saw that and I saw him. And something just clicked. And I was like, man, I'm going to get good at learning because I just wasn't a very studious kid growing up. I, I, you know, I was like a C student at best. And I was always drawing and just, you know, the butterflies and, and not paying attention. But when I came to the realization that I, there was this, you know, life filled with certain things that I, I wanted, I kind of was seeing this and I thought, I started to make this connection of like, there's, there's some things that I have to do. If I want my life to be different, then I have to start doing different things. I can't keep doing the same thing and expect a different result. So I started to see, you know, learning as this opportunity to get ahead in the world. And so I just started going into, you know, every self-help book and really big into visualization and manifestation and like the think and grow rich and Napoleon Hill kind of stuff. It's, just, you know, so I really, kind of bought all in and into the many stories of, of successful people that I heard before. And I got inspired and, and that just kept me kind of going so that as these opportunities presented themselves, I was mindful enough to take advantage of them because I think that's, a, you know, a big part of the blockage with a lot of people is that they're not even open to opportunities because they're so closed off of to what, you know, is possible that you don't walk around being optimistic or being open-minded to what's there. And I sit back and, you know, I, I very intentional about certain things. I, you know, again, very much into mindfulness and manifestation and visualization and all of that. Um, it helps me, it helps. It, and I've got a ton of tangible things that have happened, you know, examples where that, has worked out. So I trust the process and just go through it, you know, and have realized that, you know, I want my life to look like a certain thing. And I want to have an impact on other people and entrepreneurs and inspire other people to go out and kind of accomplish their goals and not sit in fear of, of failure and letting that you know, like that's the dream killer right there is people's mm. fear. You know, fear is a ultimate motivator in everything. Obviously we can see, you know, there's just, that's, that's something that really cripples people and paralyzes them from, from, from taking action. And so when you remove that fear, you, you open up all these possibilities, you know, you stop limiting yourself to this small mindset and this small mentality and this, you know, it's, it's a, it's abundance. It's, what, what, you know, what are you willing to work for? You know? So when you accept that, that just became a part of my, my daily narrative is like, this is what I want and I'm going to work hard until I accomplish it. And no one's going to tell me any different and that's it. And so if you rely on yourself to not fail, then, then what do you have to worry about? You know, that's, that's really, I, I, I bought all into that. And, and that's been something that sort of guided me and, and, and helped me kind of stay on track through all of the ups and downs of all these, you know, I've had this one company that I've worked on for 14 years to, to get there, you know, everything in my life has been about patience and timing and, and it's been like a common theme, but with all of that came a lot of hard work and, um, overcoming adversity. And so it kind of makes you very proud and be able to appreciate those wins and the journey a little bit more because you're, you know, your, your grit and, and your ability to bounce back from things. It doesn't happen from the wins. It's from the failures. It's from the challenges, you know, that's what helps you grow as a person. So 
I was able to stop feeling sorry for myself and really look at all the adversity as challenges and things that I was just proud to get past and look back and go, yeah, that sucked and this sucked, but look where I am now, you know, and, and, and so it gives me motivation to kind of keep going. I think it's a very important message. I think that's something that me and Aaron are missing. I think I know what that is. We have one key ingredient. I think me and Aaron worked at a gym that we do not speak of on this podcast. We have a very similar background to you, but I think the one thing that we're missing in our lives is Ty Lopez. <laughs> that everybody you know everybody can use a little ty lopez everybody can use a little ty lopez <laughs> yeah 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 so um i got a question for you because obviously you would had some racing experience that you've done with before with your race car um and then obviously you've fought mma you've had jujitsu matches so what's a bigger rush race car like a, like a dead to end, like, okay, I got to try and finish off a race or like an MMA match. That's again, you guys are neck and neck. It's who wins the next round, whatever. Like what's a bigger rush. I, I would have said the MMA until I raced Baja because what happened to me out there is what made it the scariest for sure thing that's ever happened to me. Um, because it's a very serious race. So this in the Baja uh, 500 races or Baja 1000 races, you have essentially 15 roughly classes of vehicles. So you have everything from these million dollar trophy trucks to dirt bikes, quads, four by fours. And you have a certain amount of time to finish this race. And we have a, a race meeting the night before with everybody. And a big part of that is about safety because almost every year, some, you know, people die in this race. Mm -hmm. So they try to really talk to everybody and, and go, yes, there's money at stake, right? There's people that are racing for Honda and, you know, Kawasaki and all these different companies and have chase helicopters and we get it. It's on TV, all this stuff, but people's lives are at stake. So let's, you know, there are people that are not professionals that spend money to go race like this, you know, and for us to race, we raced quads. So we raced, you know, in, in, in this in quads, which by the way, I don't recommend because it's scary as shit. And <laughs> when you're racing and you're on a little quad and a, and a huge trophy truck comes flying past you at 150 miles an hour, just kicking up dust and you can't see anything. Let me just tell you is I don't recommend it, but we did it. And we had a whole chase team and we had three drivers. I mean, it was, a, it's a, it's a, it's a production for sure, right? To do these. And I each kind of on this leg, when somebody is on the bike, they're going to a destination. Well, your race team is, is with the other rider heading to that destination to meet you there so that they could switch riders. And then they'll take that person to another one. And, and it's a whole, you know, production. So I got on the bike for my second leg of the race and was maybe 20 minutes into it. And I remember being on this straightaway and kind of really getting after it going like around 80, 85 miles an hour. And the course, you think about just random spots in Mexico, right? It's just, I mean, there are people out there trying to dig booby traps to, to watch you flip your bike. There are dogs that attack you. You get stuck out there and leave your bike for 10 seconds. It's going to turn into lug nuts because the, the, the mob's going to come and get, I mean, it's, it is the wild, wild west out there. So it's a, it's not well marked they leave these little these little tassels that they'll like tie to a tree limb and they're like good fucking luck i hope that you see this when you're going 100 <laughs> miles an hour so um so i was going and looking and i was trying to figure out where i was going so i started to slow down a little bit and i just remember hearing this like chirping of brakes like somebody coming up fast behind me and this two person um doom buggy big ass doom buggy smashes right into the back of me and on the back of my bike was the GPS. And at the time, my wife was back in Virginia, sending the coordinates of where I was GPS to the race team to let them know where I was, because that was the only way they had of tracking us that exploded, and it blew off like so now no more GPS. It also took out my back brakes, I had no rear tail light. And, and it threw me over the handlebars off uh, the road into a little ravine and into a bush. So I kind of crash. I don't fall off the bike, but I'm, I'm over the front and I'm hit. And this son of a bitch just takes off, just leaves. 
hit me and left. So I found out it was who it was this German race team uh, who ended up winning their division for that thing. I was looking for this, this guy. Once the race was over, all I was doing was just looking around for this guy. I was just walking. I was going to walk up and just knock his fucking head off because he just, you know, he literally just hit me and left. Didn't care if I was okay, you know, whatever. So it took me after kind of getting myself back together, it took me an additional two hours longer than it was supposed to, to get to the checkpoint where my dad was waiting to hop on the bike and, and do his leg. No way of communicating because it, it smashed part of my backpack that had our satellite numbers on it. I had no satellite radio. I had no back brakes and I just got hit. So I'm a little, you know, nervous. So I'm getting it, you know, together I'm, I'm going down and I'm constantly just looking behind me because in my head, I'm going to get hit again. It was, you know, and at one point I'm sitting there with no back brakes and I'm looking around and all I see is just desert. There's just literally nobody around. I'm just in the middle of the desert by myself with a broken bike, no way to contact anybody. And if I don't get to this next checkpoint that I hope I can get to before dark, I might be able to get my head chopped off. I don't know. Like, I don't know what happens Jeez. in Mexico in the fucking desert and does dark. I don't know. Bad things probably. So, yeah. um, so that, and we actually still finished that race. We had a qualified finish because you can still finish the race, but it, if it's past the allotted time, they, it's a, yeah, then you're did right. not finished. Basically we finished it with 16 seconds to spare, Oh boy, which was an incredible <laughs> feat uh, that we did. But that, that experience was, was Dang. by far one of the, the most intense, you know, like just life or death, fight or flight kind of a scenarios that I've been in personally, for sure. Wow. Yeah. Second. And that's probably only second to that, uh, that seminar you went to with the chi and the guy going flying and <laughs> earth, earth shattering stuff, incredible. you know, that was incredible. I want to <clears> just, <throat> just gonna wrap everything up. Um, do you, I was, I want to give you closing remarks. Um, any sponsors you want to thank any shout outs you want to give to anybody. So I will give a huge shout out to my jujitsu school in Northern Virginia for anybody that is in the area to Silverback Academy in Chantilly, Virginia. Sean Stupman, our, our beloved instructor, who is uh, an absolute ninja. So shout out to him and uh, Tom DeBlass, our association, who will be coming down this Friday for our black belt uh, promotion, which is uh, amazing. So excited to um, see him. And uh, obviously to Rob from McDojo Life. I love that guy to death. He has uh, been hugely helpful. Uh, Chewy and Eugene from uh, the Jiu-Jitsu podcast. They are, if anybody has not followed them or does not follow them on YouTube, he's got tons of amazing Jiu-Jitsu content, answers questions. He's, he's a phenomenal resource. So definitely uh, check him out. And, um, you know, epic role, obviously. Go on. It's, it's, uh, it's worth checking out, I would say. I would say Check so. Yeah, not too biased. Buy my I'm shit. I'm not saying too biased. <laughs> buy, buy my, my shit. Epic roll, buy my <laughs> shit. And if you also want to buy some other stuff that it's it's uh, his qu uh, quality, you can also check out Spirit Leaf Waterdown up in Canada, located at Aaron. At 64 Hamilton Street North in Waterdown, Ontario. You got CBD, THC, C3PO, R2D2, all the stuff that you need. I mean, <laughs> if you're ever north of the border, it's legal up here. What's legal? You don't know. You're going to have to go to Spirit Leaf Lauderdale, located at 64 Hamilton Street North to find out. <laughs> Alex and his team are, are mint. That's all I'll say. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Hey, I well, got CBD Matt in this drink. There you go. Yeah. And that, that's the nice thing because you can like in your Kilcrift drinks down there, you can have it. We can't have that in a, a pure. Yeah. They still haven't legalized. You can't have CBD. CBD? I thought, I thought no, no, we, no, no. we, legal we can have CBD, but we can't have it like in um, like drinks or alcohol or anything like that yet. They're still regulating. Oh, that, oh, that, that makes sense. No, no, no. It's cool. All of the chemicals in the drinks are totally cool, but no, we, God knows we wouldn't want anything healthy in there to help. <laughs> no, I, know. No, I get it. I get it. But that's, that's where, uh, our, our, no, no, our it makes perfect there. sense. It, I get it. It's just whatever. Definitely. But, <laughs> but you, can get, you can get a full, full-on concentrated bottle at spirit leaf water down located at Aaron. one more time i'm not doing it again all right <laughs> yes you are it's at yes, 64 hamilton 64. street north Six. <laughs> you're, water you're down ontario it's the only reason why because i like alex and that's the only reason why i'll keep doing it 
Buy Alex's shit. Leave this in. <laughs> Matt, it's been an awesome pleasure having you on the podcast. We really do appreciate you coming on and hanging out with us, especially for the hour and dealing with our shenanigans from the North, but we do appreciate it. I loved it, guys. Thank you so much, man. It was so awesome to connect with you guys. Uh, let's do it again sometime for sure. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye.